Hello my dear all, as promised, we are here with you again with our pro Guru Gedera program. So, before moving on to today's lesson, I would like to ask you this question. How many of you are familiar with a poem or a song or its lyrics written about one of the major rivers in our country? Have you learnt any of the poems or songs to adore or to discuss the beauty of any of these rivers? River Kalu, River Mahavali, or the River Kalani, one of the four major rivers, right? So, or any other river, its use and everything. So, you might have learned uh, in your Sinhala lesson most probably in any of your grades up to now. So I think with my introduction, you may be able to think of the lesson that we are going to discuss today. Yes, can you guess it? Let's see, to the Nile by John Keats. So you can see a picture that tells about the ancient history of Egypt, right? So you might have seen this picture and then you can see some pyramids in the background and a river and everything is there, right? So, To the Nile by Sean Keats, here uh, very clearly the title itself uh, reveals that the poet is going to talk about this river Nile and there is an interesting story about this poem but of course I am going to tell it at the end of the lesson, not right now and uh, here my uh, aim of the lesson is uh, given here, what is the attitude of the poet to this river of course, is it a special river and what makes the writer to change his attitude. So based on these three questions, we will move on with our lesson and first of all as usual I am going to tell uh, the life story or the biography of this particular popular English poet John Keats and there are a lot of uh, interesting or oh, we will say some kind of uh, pathetic as well stories to tell you about this writer and then he was born in London on 31st October 1795 and father was a hostler or a ostler so that is to say children that his father was the one who was taking care of uh, horses in a stable uh, in an inn right so in whatever inn so they are particular inn he was working and then he was the person who was in charge of the horses in that stable, right? So then had lost his father when he was eight. So think of a child who lost his father at the age of eight and this particular death was very special to him in life because father's death more than uh, it is uh, like you know very sorrowful to him because father had fallen off the horse on his way back seeing John Keats and his brother at their school. So think of it, the father fell off the horse and he had a uh, crack in his uh, skull and that was the reason for his death after seeing the kids on his way back. So it is very pathetic, that is why I told you at the beginning, right? So then after that, uh, he lived with his grandmother in Edmonton and lost his mother again at the age of 14. So then mother had uh, named two caretakers for the guardians for these kids and then after that his life of course was uh, different and registered as a medical student. Now think of the field, right? Medical student under a surgeon in Guy's hospital and he got his apothecary license. That means that he can prescribe medicine to the patient. Then after that he could practice as an apothecary or a physician and surgeon because he got that training. But still, he uh, informed his uh, guardian that he resolved to be a poet. He did not stop uh, his training or education as a physician because he could practice all these things. While working and continuing his training at Guy's uh, hospital, he devoted more time to study literature and became a second generation romantic poet. Right children? Now when you think of the life of this writer, like any other most uh, any other writer because you might have heard most of the writers uh, that we get to know in English literature 
did not have a life of bed of rose, right. They were all having a very hard life just because of uh, their parents had to move from uh, place to place uh, according to the prevailing situations in the country or whatever the job that they were doing. So, always they had a hit or kind of like hard life. Now, think of this person also lost the father at, a, at the age of 8, again mother at the age of 14, still he continued in his life to achieve his dreams. It is a very good example for us as well. That is why I was uh, telling uh, many more things about his life, right? Because it, he, he sets an example to all of us to achieve our dreams amidst of all the hindrances or the difficulties. Okay, children, let us move on to our poem then. And then the location of this uh, river is important. And this is a, a weave or panoramic weave of the river. I have shown you this. Uh, because uh, this river seems to be something very special in the past or in the ancient Egypt, right. So, you, when you hear the name of this river, the river Nile, you will remember what you learned specially in your history lessons, right. So, then uh, I would like to give some uh, background information or else like some more details about this uh, history uh, or the Egyptian uh, history. Right. So, I ask you several questions here. What do you know about the river Nile? Is it a major, it is a major north flowing river and supposed to be the longest river in the world and then after that was the life of ancient Egypt, Egyptians. So, that is the most important point that we have to think of here other than its uh, length and becoming the longest river in the world. So, was the life of ancient Egypt. So, when the word life comes to you, think of it, right, the civilization and everything provided fundamental source of water and food for life and protection and spiritual life of the people uh, those days. The river was the fundamental source of water. When there is water, they can find food, right, so that is why. The god of river Nile is the Greek god Nilu. Then, Regularity of the river Nile floods brought nutrient rich soil to the banks of the river. So, you know that when the river banks are full of rich soil, it is the ideal uh, situation or the background for things to grow. So, I have shown you a beautiful picture of greenery and where they are going to like grow things and that is how this great civilization uh, just developed or grew, grew right. So, valuable resource for farmers to grow wheat and barley, those are the two types of things they grew right at the beginning. I mean this is somewhere in the past, that is not the uh, same thing here now, right. This dynamic made the Egypt one of the most great places, right. So, river Nile was the reason or the root cause of all this rich culture, right. Then they started trade traditions with agricultural products because they had plenty of things there. Then after that, they exchanged goods within the country up to Greece, Mesopotamia and Rome. So, you might have learned all these things in your history lessons as well. And they built great pyramids in Giza. It is a very popular one and you all know about Giza pyramids, right. So, I have given you a picture of that, one of the ancient seven wonders of course. And 2580 to 2560 BC before Christ. During its fourth dynasty, they uh, built this and Paro used slavery of course. Paros used uh, slavery to build this and this is a huge construction of course. And the wonder is that it had been uh, built during a period wheels were not invented. So, to build up this huge thing, how did they carry those heavy uh, blocks of stones is something that is mysterious, right. So, they say that uh, they might have used some human labor and kind of ropes like things, fine. So, with all these things have an idea of what this river Nile has given to these people in Egypt in the ancient era, right. So, then after that take your book and read the poem. 
and uh, count the number of lines in it. It is something important because today you are going to learn uh, something new with this poem and I want you to count the number of lines. So, if you count it, you get it as 14 lines. So, when there are 14 lines, it has sonnet form, right? Then, in literature, there are many other types of sonnet forms, but there are two types of popular sonnets. That is one Italian or the Petrarchan sonnet. It has octave and sestate and this particular poem to the Nile is of course a Petrarchan sonnet and we will see now what is octave and sestate is not new to you. I explain in uh, when I was doing literary devices what an octave is and a sestate is right. So, then after that the next one is Shakespearean sonnet. Then again there are three quatrains. Again you know that quatrain is four lined verse and then when it 4 into 3, 12 and again a rhyming couplet and there is the particular typical rhyming scheme known as A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F. Then 4, 8, 12 and G, G, 14 lines. So, that is Shakespearean sonnet and uh, the concern of our lesson today is not to discuss about Shakespearean sonnet, but this is under Petrarchian sonnet, we are, we are going to divide the poem into octave and sestate, that means 8 lines and 6 lines. And another particular feature of uh, sonnet form is that there is a, a division like you know sestate, of course the 8, 9, 10th like 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, right. So, then the ninth line uh, changes the direction of the idea that the writer is conveying or it takes to another direction. So, that is known as vault. So, then uh, in this poem also we can see the ninth line uh, is special because uh, thereafter uh, what the writer is going to think of the river is something different, right. So, let us read the poem. So, the first line is take your book at the same time or you can look at the a screen and just see what is there on it or else take your own books and read. Son of the old moon mountains African, chief of the pyramid and crocodile, we call thee fruitful and that too very while a desert fills our seeing inward span. Again, nurse of what nation since the world began, art thou so fruitful? Oh, dost thou beguile such men to honour thee who warned with toil, pressed for a space twixt Cairo and Deccan. Right, those are the first eight lines or the octave. I am going to discuss about this later and let us read the whole poem first. Then the ninth line, oh, may dark fancies, uh, they surely do. It is ignorance that makes a barren waste of old beyond itself, thou dost be this. Green rushes like our, our rivers and dust taste the pleasant sunrise, green isles hast thou too, and to the sea as happily dost taste. So, when you read these lines, did you get any idea or did you get any picture about this river because I showed you certain things and with this background I gave you when you were reading these lines how did you feel? So, did you see that the writer is talking about this river Nile in the first eight lines taking it as a very special river right we will see how he is going to talk about this as a special river fine. So, you have to uh, read these first eight lines, the octave very well children, right. So, let us see. Son of the old moon mountains of Rickon, chief of the pyramid and crocodile, we call thee fruitful. A desert fills our seeing inward span, nurse of thwart nation since the world began. Art thou so fruitful? O dost thou beguile such men to honour thee who worn with toil? Right, read the octave first. 
that is what I did a little while ago, right. Then when we take each line, so that is why I read it for the second time because it is octave, I wanted to pay attention to that uh, to get a clear understanding or to read uh, this poem uh, from the perspective of the writer in his first eight lines, right. Sun of the old moon, mountains African. Now look at these words, sun of the old moon mountains African. Again the important word, chief of the pyramid and crocodile. So there we get uh, two images, visual images. One is a uh, pyramid, the other one is crocodile and chief, right. We call thee fruitful. So you have some kind of uh, richness in it. That very while a desert fills our scenes in word span. Now look at that particular uh, set of words, seeing inward span. Of course, what is that children? What does the writer mean by these three words? Seeing inward span, what we can see with our eyes, right? Nurse, again important word, of swart nations since the world began. Art thou so fruitful? It's asking a question, what is that technique there in the line? Question is there, so that is a rhetoric question, right? Art thou so fruitful? Thou again, what is that? Archaic language, right? So old English to say you. Are you so fruitful? That is the modern version. Oh, dost thou beguile? Dost, dost, d o s t, right? Such men, again, such men to honor thee who worn with toil, rest for peace, rest for a peace, twixt care. Cairo and taken. So, twist means again between old English, right. So, here uh, I just gave some hints because I have uh, prepared a, a particular small activity for you, right. So, again read these lines very well. Now, just after we started reading the poem, this is the third time because it is not uh, at once easily uh, you can understand, right. So, that is why I am uh, paying attention to these lines again and again and here is my uh, particular activity. Here I have given you the meanings, consider the richness of the soil, hails it and its charming beauty, desert stretches as far as the eye can see, the Nile as god of the world of men and animals, ruler over this land serving as its ultimate chief. So, remember the meanings of these uh, lines I have given you. Can you think of the activity that I have thought of, right? So, uh, actually I will uh, just move on to the previous slide and uh, remember the lines, those few lines again up to H, right? I have labeled and given you and the first eight lines and then I have given you some meanings here four and the other four. It cut through areas of desert spaces providing a birthplace for numerous nations since the, since the beginning of the world. It is truly as great river, is it truly as great river as is usually believed or charm the people? That is the question that he has. Life giving waters sustain us and connect us as we rest between the spaces along life's journey. Right, so between the life's journey, uh, the water, life giving water of the river sustain and connect us and rest between the space, right, uh, between us. That is why that twixt Cairo and Deccan is there, life's journey. Remember that meaning I have given for that line. I think you may get a time to note down these things, but do not worry if you miss anything, uh, you have a way to watch this again, right. You know it very well, what to do, you know it. Just log on to yes, NI channel and watch this later and then move for the time being, let us move on with this. People respect the river that has given them life. Those are the uh, meanings that I have given for the eight lines and I want you to match these with the lines in the poem. So, this take little bit time and I know uh, you may sometimes find it bit difficult to go ahead with an activity like this 
in a particular situation like this where I do not meet you and I can't give you lot of time to copy these things and do this, right. So, let me move on to the next slide and I have given you the answers, right. Son of the old moon mountains African. So, there the writer hails or venerate it and talking about the charming beauty, old moon mountains African and sun as a sun, right. So, we will talk about this later, the meaning of the word sun here and why that particular word is given. Think of that word sun, S U N sun is not here, but S O N sun because we uh, in one of the poems that is uh, the eagle, we discuss that uh, how that uh, sun life giver, here S O N sun, what are we going to do with that, let us see. Then second one, chief of the pyramid and crocodile. So, the river Nile as god of the world of men and animals because men, how you get the idea of men? The word pyramid suggest men, right? Their pyramid was made by men and crocodile you find in that river. So, there the Nile as god of the world of men and animals. Oh, Nile is the ruler over this land serving as its ultimate chief. Children, now can you understand why I gave you a particular you know, details about this river Nile just before I started this poem. So, with that information I gave you, you can easily understand the ideas conveyed by the writer here. So, understand that this uh, river was the life of ancient Egyptians, right. So, that is why they say that the river as god of the world of men and animals because animals also contributed to their life and crocodile is a waterborne animal, isn't it? It lives in water and it comes to the land as well to catch its prey, but it does not stay uh, both. So, it is a, a kind of animal uh, and then that refers to the word crocodile of course, symbolic of the whole entire animal kingdom, right. Then after that, we call thee fruitful and that to very while, the next line is there, we call thee fruitful, consider the richness of the soil of the banks of the river. I told you that uh, regularity of the floods of the river Nile made them grow as a industrial, I mean agricultural uh, industry there, right. So, they prospered, fine. Next one. A desert fills our seeing inward span. So, when we look at this river, the river flows, but still desert stretch as far as I can see when we look at this beyond the river, what we can see is the desert. So, cutting through the desert, this fine river flows down, making or giving life to many of the people. So, here you can understand that the writer is talking about the blessings or the other than the beauty of this river, the use of it, blessings of it to man. Then nurse of swart nation since the world began, what is the meaning of it? Nurse of swart nation, nurse, the idea of nurse, of course, yes, somebody who is taking care of us, right, we will see. It cuts through areas of desert spaces providing a birthplace for numerous nations since the beginning of the world, that is the idea, right. Cut through the desert, but still providing a birthplace for numerous nations. So, that was the place where that uh, rich civilization started, right. Then after that, art thou so fruitful? That is the question. Now, he talks about all these things, how the nation uh, prospered using the river banks and everything, but art thou so fruitful or dost thou beguile? Is it truly as great river as it is usually believed or really do you charm people? Fine. Then such men to honour thee who worn with toil, people respect the river that has given them life, right. So, then that is why the writer or John Keats thinks that people respect and 
consider this river to be so special? Can you remember my first question? The second question, is it special? Yes, it was a special river for ancient, for ancient Egyptians because that was the life for them. Then, next line, rest for a space, tricked Cairo and Deccan. They are life-giving waters, sustain us and connect us as we rest between the space along life journey because we have stayed here and Cairo is the place where the, I think this uh, river flows into the sea, river mouth like. So Cairo is the place of the river and then after that a life giving water sustain us and connect us as we rest between this space, river and the uh, universe. So then life journey, journey of life is helped by this. Cairo and Deccan. Fine. Then we are going to move on to the septet. But before that, that octave. Can you remember the attitude of the writer? So he was thinking of a very much uh, useful river it was to Egyptians. And he was thinking of it why people were venerating. But actually, uh, this river cuts through the desert when we see. Uh, when we look around and we can see what is there as far as we can see our naked eye can see the long distance far stretched river and the desert and the use of it and then again when it comes to the ninth line uh, quiet question something like this right? oh, oh may dark fancy sir they surely do this ignorance that makes a barren waste of all beyond itself thou dost be deep green rushes like our rivers and dust taste the pleasant sunrise green isles hast thou too and do the sea as happily does taste here children uh, now i told you the first eight lines or the octave he was talking about having a very good uh, attitude towards this river as something that gave life to many nations uh, to come up and its rich soil and he was talking about the beauty of it at the same time that he was surprising that this particular river cuts through the deserts and uh, its power to rule the men and animals right so he was talking uh, very uh, positively uh, admiring the river like and a kind of uh, venerating suddenly he says oh may dark fancies err uh, they surely do now we understand that with uh, that uh, perspective he had uh, uh, right at the beginning though he was uh, thinking uh, very much uh, fascinatingly about this river now he is going to change his attitude and talk about it in a different way because he thinks that he made a kind of confusion and kind of mistake and this because of this uh, confusion that whether he has made a mistake uh, to admire this river like this as he was doing in those uh, eight lines and he says yes surely it can happen and that is a kind of ignorance that has made this uh, mistake and waste right so then he says just beyond everything this river is something similar to the other rivers how he is going to present that idea that thou dost believe green rushes like our rivers so can you remember dear children how the writer addresses the river like thou dost believe green rushes like our rivers when you were studying or when you were learning the poem evening star can you remember the writer was addressing the star and talking addressing the star admiring it and at the same time asking it to bless them right so here the writer was talking about the blessings of the river to the people and he had a kind of surprise and then after that he says apart from all these there is something that I can see. You are also this river. You also have green rushes like our rivers. So he says that just like any other river, you too have green rushes. Here, our river is important because 
can you remember I told you that this poet is uh, an English poet and he was born in England and he was talking about this rivers that he finds in his country. So, he compares his, uh, the rivers that he sees in his country and the river Nile and then he tells that you two have the same thing, right? Then, dost thou taste the pleasant sunrise? So, like all the other rivers get the sun, uh, sun falls onto you, sunrise, you too have that, right. So, you also enjoy the sunrise, that means you also get the sun's rays like that other rivers get and green eyes hast thou too and to the sea as happily thou hast. So, just like all the other rivers in the sea, you too flows down to the sea. So, they are in the 14th line, he says that you are not a very special river. The same as all the other rivers in the world, in my country, you also fall into the sea. Your cause is that, right? So, I think I explained everything and then my question is very easy for you. Find the lines to say that writer thinks he has been in a fantasy world, sure it makes mistakes. He compares the river Nile to the rivers in England. It is lack of knowledge that makes the land barren. Says that Nile to go to the sea. Says that the Nile too goes to the sea, right? Then writer thinks he has been in a fantasy world. Sure, it makes mistakes. Yes when he says that oh may dark fancy the they surely do that is the idea that writer wanted to convey and i have given that for you right writer thinks he has been in a fantasy world and sure it makes mistakes right there you can see these uh, green rushes that grow on river banks right so like any other river nile too has got them he compares river Nile to the rivers in England. So, how does he do that? With what lines in the poem we get that idea children? Yes, the two lines number 12 and number 13. Green rushes like our rivers. Now, remember our rivers means maybe the writer is referring to the rivers in his country, right? In England and dust taste the pleasant sunrise. Right, so you too taste, you also get the sunrise, sun races. Green eyes has thou too, because of that, you also have got green eyes and green rushes. Right, then says that Nile too goes to the sea, and to the sea as happily does taste. So, here you see a lot of uh, words uh, related to old English, does taste, right? Then it is lack of knowledge and that ignorance has made this confusion. It is ignorance that makes a barren waste. So, the uh, six lines after the octave, the septet of course has given us the clear idea of the writer that he is no more with the idea that uh, the river Nile is a special one. Now, with the ninth line that he is presenting the idea that he has a, he has made a kind of a mistake or a kind of a confusion like and then he is going to justify, okay, how can I say that you are special because I see something common to all the other rivers, you too have those, right. So, here the writers attitude or the idea has changed after the ninth line. Uh, the rest of the five lines give the reasoning out, right. So, he compares the rivers in England to this Nile and say that, he says that the river Nile also is something similar to all the other rivers, no speciality in it. You, that river is also something like another river, right. The idea is clear to you children. Now, most important thing in this poem is that you are going to learn about the Petakian uh, sonnet form and we are going to talk about this octave and sestate and then after that 
other than that uh, in my uh, attempt to teach you some other things uh, that are in the poem that is to talk about the techniques and then about the theme and let us see what we can uh, do uh, to discuss the techniques of the poem right. So, here it is very special uh, other than this uh, Petrarchian sonnet form these are the other features we can take techniques one is uh, use of exclamation marks. Now, if you have got your books with you just read the lines and find out those uh, marks of exclamation right in the lines all right not a question mark, but to uh, show that kind of surprise or kind of addressing uh, to someone who is not to be seen or hear like right. So, appealing to something that is not present or cannot hear right. Can you find out the example for this? All right, go through the book and find some uh, examples for this exclamation mark right. So, that is to talk about something that is not present or cannot hear, but uh, the writer is going to present that idea. What can you remember about the crocodiles and uh, pyramids and crocodiles and then he uses rhetoric questions after that to show his doubts rhetoric questions. So, question mark in the lines right. He questions whether the river is so fruitful can you remember the line in the poem, can you find that line in the poem, fine. Then after that he has used this definite article the in a particular line uh, the chief of the pyramids and the crocodile. There it is a kind of reminder that the Nile is ruler over this land the article the chief nothing else nobody else right they are the is very important serving as its ultimate chief no other chief is there. So, now children think of all these techniques. So, we have to be very careful in selecting these things. So, in your context questions very often what they do is uh, they check for your knowledge about these techniques and they ask you mention two or three techniques that you find in these lines given. So, for that of course, you have to have a very good clear uh, idea at the same time you should learn how to do that right. So, this rhetoric question of course, question form, uh, question mark given at the end of a line there I have told you that the writer is not expecting any answer from the reader, but he is going to raise that question to present his idea and at times to give his doubts or to make his reader think of it right. So, rhetoric questions very important there here mark of exclamation also when we call somebody also we use that right. So, to give a kind of address fine ok children. Now, let us move on to the next slide and the definite article the I was talking about this and then after that uh, run on lines. So, that is why I have given you this line 11, 12 and 13 of all beyond itself thou dost be deep green rushes like our rivers. Now, can you remember the end of the line 11 you have three words thou dost be deep to get the meaning of it fully you have to run to the next line that means the twelfth one and then when you read it together you get the idea thou dost be deep green rushes like our rivers and thus taste the pleasant sunrise to get the meaning you have to read number 12 and 13 together thus taste the pleasant sunrise. So, from number 12 line you have to move on to 13 to get the particular idea conveyed by the writer. So, in such cases we call it run on lines is it clear to you now that is why I have mentioned it as line 11, 12, 13. Then we have metaphors and then nurse providing nourishment and sustenance. They are nurse of the sword nation. Then sun. Now, usually when it refers to a river in literature we take it as a feminine gender usually her is there, but here the writer gives the word sun masculine reference to a river. 
maybe to show its strength in giving life. Can you remember children? Uh, at the beginning I gave you some uh, details about this uh, civilization and the life of Egyptians uh, in the ancient era. So then because of the river only they could have their life. So that is why they consider the river Nile is their life, right. So it was the fundamental source of food and water for them. So to give that idea the writer might have given that masculine reference son, right, might have given. At the same time, uh, of course, river is the life giver. With that idea, that reference is very appropriate, I hope, right. Then after that, there are some other symbolisms like chief of the pyramids and crocodile. So pyramids and crocodile represent human beings and the animals, right. Then after that archaic language, of course, we had enough of words like thou, thus, tweaked and everything. In visual imagery, the poem is a uh, rich with that, that uh, green rushes and everything comes to our mind, crocodiles, even all that. And then write a stone, it is formal and reverent because he thinks that right at the beginning, this river is very special and important. But later on we see how he's changed his attitude. Now can you remember my third question, what made the writer change his attitude? So he compared at the end uh, the rivers in his country with Nile. The Nile River is associated with both the pyramid and crocodile. That the Nile is ruler over this land serving as its ultimate chief, right. So the picture of pyramids and again the crocodile for you all to get a, uh, some interesting ideas and some clear idea of all these things. And then after that, art thou so fruitful or dost thou beguile such men to honour thee who worn with toil. So these are some special ideas in his uh, poem and they are the rhetoric question. I told you that he questions whether the river is fruitful. So that is given in uh, old English, art thou so fruitful? Oh, dost thou beguile such men to honour thee who worn with toil? So what is the idea of it? Keith is pondering whether the Nile has been so hailed purely because those who encounter it are so grateful to come upon a river in a land of such desert. Now you know see the desert land because he told that seeing, uh, he was comparing that, that what the others can see is the desert and the river cut through the desert. So he is going to talk about this and he is thinking that just because of this they are paying their uh, gratitude to this as it came cutting through the desert. So that is why he says that people are thinking of you or venerating you because of this reason, right? Art thou so fruitful or dost thou beguile such men to honour thee who worn with toil on the river bank? They of course found a life, that is why, right? Hmm. Then the other idea, oh, may dark fancies err, they surely do. This is also something uh, that you have to understand very clearly. So I have given you a detailed uh, count of it. The perspective changes from what has only been suggested to a clear affirmation or confirmation that the writer is going to consider this river is no longer a great uh, one of its reputation as considered. He is keen to put behind him the dark idea that the Nile is not truly as great river as is usually believed. Now he is going to uh, move away with that idea. The river Nile is usually believed to be a great river. And the writer also had that idea, but no more he is going to have that idea. That is why he says the dark fancies are and they surely do. Whether the river deserves its reputation, he has a kind of a question in his mind. Actually, is this river worth that reputation that is, it is given? So then after that, by this he means that the Niles were truly a god. So can you remember that uh, there was kind of idea that it was the ruler, the chief or the god of men and animal ruling over that place. So here the writer is going to say or hint us that uh, idea, if this river was truly a god, its fruitfulness should be there to the entire country, to the whole country, not only to the banks of the river or its delta. So that is the idea he is going to present, right? So the river 
as a mere river, not as anything to be revered. Now, can you remember the water and that green uh, rushes growing on it and everything is quite natural just like any other river and this river is not to be considered as a special one. That is how he is going to conclude or he is going to end up his poem with that idea in mind. So, he changes its attitude from the beginning uh, when it comes to the end of his poem, he changes it and he is having different attitude, fine. Then, do you know children, I told you that there is an interesting story behind this uh, poem. So, this poem is a result of writing challenge. There were three poets, John Keats, Leigh Hunt and Percy Shelley, right? So, they three had a competition like thing and they had a, a, an idea that within 15 minutes, they should write a poem about Nile. So, when they came up with their poem, so the lay hunt was the host like you know one evening at a party like gathering, right. So, then after reading Keith's poem, he uh, accepted his failure or the loser. He told that, okay, my poem is not uh, so beautiful like yours may be the idea. So, he came up with the idea that he is not going to win, he is the loser. Then unfortunately, uh, what Shelley wrote was not something about the Nile, but you might have heard about this poem. He came up with a poem known as Osmandias. It was in the old syllabus of course, uh, many years ago. Uh, sometimes you might have read. So, that is why. So, anyway, these three poets had a, a kind of like a idea to write a poem. Now, who won it? Uh, of course, uh, John Keats won it and that is why this poem came into being, like that competition, that idea to write poem. So, is not it an interesting story, the origin of this story, like how it came, fine. So, I think uh, you learnt a lot about uh, uh, this uh, Egyptian uh, nation and how this river Nile helped uh, it to grow as a civilization and then a civilization and then after that. Uh, about uh, the writer's attitude towards this Nile and uh, you learnt uh, special things like uh, Petrarchian sonnets and Shakespearean sonnets and then the story of this uh, poem, how it came and the life story of Joan Keats. So, I think you are going to end up with a great deal of things for the day and I hope you can remember everything I told you and enjoy the poem and I hope to uh, teach you another poem uh, next day. Until that, let me wind up the lesson. Goodbye, stay safe.